is really about developing yourself as a person and lifelong learning. So one of our core values at Colossal Learning Solutions is that passion for continuous learning. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Where Accountants Go, the Accounting Careers Podcast. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for this show. Well, today we have a dynamite, upbeat guest for you. And we recorded this, by the way, after she had been teaching custom continuing education courses all week. Melissa Galasso from Galasso Learning Solutions joined us for the program this week. And I think you're really going to enjoy her story. We're going to delve into how she chose accounting as a career in the first place. And by the way, she passed the CPA exam on the first sitting, but a little later, she realized that her passion was in teaching and instructing. So she pursued a couple avenues for that, and now she owns her own continuing education company. And she has an interesting twist on providing continuing education. She's doing custom courses for groups, so it's only content that they really, truly need. It's not off-the-shelf content, per se. It's a really interesting business model, and she started as an accountant, just like you and me. This was fun to record, and I think you're going to find a lot of value in it as well for yourself, particularly if if you've ever given thought to how you can spin your passion into a business idea, because that's exactly what Melissa has done. If you do enjoy and learn something from this episode, please share it out on social media. I know I mention this a lot, but we just love getting new listeners. So whatever your social media option of choice is, please share out the show. Please help others find it. We really would appreciate it. Well, let's go ahead and get started with today's interview. Here's Melissa Galasso of Galasso Learning Solutions. Hello, Melissa. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. No problem. No problem. This will be fun. Well, for the audience, we have Melissa Galasso on the program with us today, and she's in North Carolina. She may be the first guest we've had from North Carolina. I'm not sure. I need to go back and look at our notes, but I know we haven't had many. So <laughs> if it's not a first, it's close to it. I wanted to invite Melissa on the program because it's been a while since we had an educator on the show. And, and I know many of us accountants have thought about teaching at some level, whether at a university or for continuing education courses or something like that. But many of us think of that. And Melissa's actually done both. Plus, she's got quite the background in accounting herself. So this is really going to be a good interview. Melissa, I really do want to get to your overall career history and or get through that to the present day rather. But it is important that we show the audience how you got to where you are today. So let's start at the beginning. What led you to consider accounting as a possible career choice in the first place? Well, believe it or not, I did not go to school to become an accountant. That was not even one of the remote options when I went to school. And so when I was applying to universities, my parents had very limited input besides saying, whatever you do when you graduate, you better be able to pay for yourself. So that was the only guidance I got in selecting university and selecting a major. Neither one of them were going to tell me or encourage a particular area, but they were like, you have to do something that's going to be able to pay for yourself upon graduation. I'm the oldest of three girls. And so that was our first and only experience with how that was going to work out. And so I applied to Georgetown. And at the time when you're a freshman, you actually select a school when you apply to the university. So they had four undergrad universities within, four colleges within the university. And I selected and applied to the business school because I figured if a business degree, you should be able to graduate and you should be able to get a job in that area. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew that that would be a good, stable environment. Back then, it was a little bit different how you did research on universities, but they had good graduation rates. And so I signed up and when I was accepted to the school, I was really excited. Um, No one in my family has a business background. And so no one was sort of trying to steer me in one direction or the other. I was the first one to go to get a business degree. And so I went to Georgetown and Georgetown mandates a pretty heavy first two years of just overall business. You have to take, everyone takes marketing, everyone takes management, everyone takes accounting, everyone takes finance. You have to take a little bit of everything your first two years to kind of expose you to everything. And I honestly think that's one of the best things that's ever happened. Georgetown has a big liberal arts background. So even in the accounting program, even in the business school, you still have to take two English, two math, two science, two everything. They're really 
the concept of a well-rounded person was a big element of Georgetown experience. And so while I was in the business school, I still had to take, just like everyone else, all of my generic education requirements. But then when I was in the business program, they had quite a bit. And so my very first day of school was a Wednesday morning. We always started on a Wednesday. And the first day of school, they do a special ceremony in the morning. So classes that day, the first class you could have starts at 10.15. And at 10.15 in the morning, my very first class ever was accounting. So my very first class at Georgetown was intro to accounting or accounting 101 as a freshman. And my professor's name was Srinivansan Sankanguru Swami. And if that wasn't probably the scariest thing from a girl from New York at that point, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to pronounce this. I'm going to do terrible. And I loved my first day of class. He was one of the nicest faculty. We still talk on a regular basis today, but that very first day of school, he made everyone feel really comfortable. It didn't matter that I didn't have a business background, that I had never seen a financial statement, that I didn't know what anything was in this area. He was sure to, so we'd all walk out of there in good shape. And over the course of the year, you have to take 101 and 102. And 101 is financial accounting. And I loved financial accounting. I loved that my debits equaled my credits. I knew that I did well with my trial balance balance. I was the happiest person ever. And so as a result, my second semester, you have to take 102, which was cost accounting. So I took the same person because I really enjoyed his first round. So I took his class for the second round. Uh, so I took cost accounting and I hated it. <laughs> it was not my cup of tea. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I'm done. This, I am not going to be an accounting major. I think managerial accounting is the worst thing that was ever created. And so I told him, I was like, oh, I'm not going to keep going. I'm going to look for something else. So, you know, next year I have to take finance and operations. And so I'm sure I'll find my place. And he was like, no, no, you really liked financial. And I was like, I loved financial. And he was like, yeah, but the rest of this is financial. You only have to take one more cost accounting class to graduate. Everything else can be financial accounting oriented, intermediate, advanced, et cetera. And I was like, I don't know. And he kind of sat there and this is before you registered online or anything like that. So at this point we had to present our information. It wasn't like pick it on the computer. It was to you know, submit what you want for next year and you might potentially get something off of your list. And so I said, okay, I'll take intermediate accounting. I'm not, you know, guaranteeing you that I'm going to major in accounting by any stretch of the imagination, but I heard that it really helps in finance. And so I'm going to take finance next year. So I'll take intermediate with my finance class. And so I did that and I had the most amazing intermediate financial accountant instructor ever. She was an amazing professor. She still is an amazing professor at Georgetown. She's still there to this day. And she was just fantastic. She had real world experience. She had worked in industry and everything about her. I mean, funny fact is she actually wrote on slides and then on like projector slides and then projected them. This is like pre-using PowerPoint for teaching, but it was one of the best and I loved intermediate one and two. And I guess the rest is history. I ended up majoring in accounting. I double majored in international business because I desperately wanted to study abroad and there was no other way to find a way to study abroad without having that second major. And then I minored in French. And so I studied French and Spanish all the way through lit for both of those. And so my minor as well, and I did spend one year studying abroad. So it was amazing, but it was definitely the most unexpected path ever. No intention of being an accounting major. I had that stereotype in my head of what an accounting major would look like. I definitely was not that person. And now, you know, I think this is, let's see, we had our 15th anniversary a couple of years ago. So I'm cutting close now to my 20th reunion for school. And I don't regret one bit getting that accounting degree. Wow. You had some great professors, you know, because they were determined not to let you fall off the conveyor <laughs> belt. You were supposed to be an accountant. <laughs> I was born on December 31st, so I was literally destined to be an accountant. So back when that was a tax write-off, that was like the sign that I was meant to be a CPA. Who knew? <laughs> there you go. So what was your first job out of college? Did you have to make the very serious audit or tax decision? <laughs> <laughs> I did have to make that very difficult decision, but I had interned and I had a very unusual internship experience. I knew I wanted to study abroad and that was really important to me. About 70% of Georgetown studies abroad and that was one of the big selling points of the school was the international flavor. And I knew I wanted to do a summer program as well. And so I knew I was going to France and then I wanted to go to the Oxford program, which was after your junior year that summer, which is traditionally when you would do your internship. And I managed to chat myself into, you know, enough conversations and I was active in the accounting group and so the social clubs there. And I met up with some of the firms doing that uh, my sophomore year. 
And I convinced the firm to let me apply for their junior year internships. And so it worked out. And so after my junior year, or sorry, after my sophomore year, I did my internship and I had selected audit upfront. I knew kind of where I wanted to do at that point. I loved the financial statements. And so even though I had just finished intermediate accounting and I hadn't taken some of the more advanced accounting classes at that point, Deloitte had been kind enough to take me on as an intern. And so I did my internship in the Washington, D.C. office in the Tyson's Corner office. And one of the beautiful things of doing that is that you get an offer uh, when you graduate and so, or when you finish your internship for graduation. And so I went and studied abroad my junior year and felt pretty good going into my senior year that I didn't have as much stress as a lot of other people because of my experiences. So it actually worked out really well. So an unusual path forward. And going into the Virginia office, there was no extra courses. I could just go with my bachelor's degree. The 150 hour had not yet hit Virginia. And so I didn't have to continue on and get a master's degree. So I only have a bachelor's degree. I have a lot of additional credits, but I do not have a master's degree in accounting. I stopped there, but did go straight into public accounting. And I worked in public accounting and had an amazing travel schedule, which kind of rivals what I have today. Only back then, I didn't appreciate it quite as much. (laughs) So I didn't appreciate the airplanes. I actually bought a house I never saw. So at the time, my fiance, who is still my husband now, looked at a bunch of homes and we were getting married and we wanted to buy a house. And it was the, you know, hot market of the early 2000s that you had to bid on like literally dozens of homes. And so our first home we ever bid on and won, I literally never saw it until we went to close on the home because of my travel schedule. How long did you end up staying with Deloitte? Just over a year. So I had done one year of constant travel and I knew it just, it wasn't for me. And I love the technical element of accounting, but I didn't love doing (laughs) accounting. And so I couldn't quite uh, get into that element of it. It was never, it just didn't make sense to me. And so I decided that I was going to look at alternatives and kind of figure out what my options were. And I was young and it's nice to have sometimes like a really easy starter. I was like, oh, you went to Georgetown is pretty much every interview I've ever started with. So it was always a nice little plus for me to have that as a starting point. And then having a big four experience, it did really help offer other options. And so I did uh, have that alternative there. And so I went from working into industry and I tried a couple of different things in industry from there. I started in accounting, working as a general ledger and individual, did that for a little while. And then I went into internal audit and I, again, liked the internal audit elements of it, but I had always been drawn to doing the teaching. Even when I was in college, I was a teaching and research assistant for faculty every year that I was on campus. I loved having that teaching element. And so while I was still working as an internal auditor, I started teaching for Becker because I really just was passionate about teaching and I wanted to go. I passed the CPA exam on the first try sitting through the Becker classes. Back then it was a stack of CDs. Like I had like 40 CDs and used to watch them on your laptop that had a CD player, which again is for few and far between today. But because of my travel, that was really the only way to get through it. And when I passed the CPA exam on my first try, I felt really that the system worked. And so I started to look for ways to get involved there. And then as I was going through that, I had my daughter and I didn't want to work full time right out of school. So I called Georgetown and I said, hey, I'm not that far away. Do you happen to need any faculty? And they said, oh, we actually need a fresh uh, 101 accounting instructor. And I said, if I have the opportunity to help students the same way that they helped me find my path, I was like, I am all in. And so I did that for a few years as well. So I literally have tried it all. I have done external audit, internal audit. I have done teaching in the academic space. And then, you know, I really just had a great opportunity to try various items. <laughs> I can just imagine if that call to Georgetown was, well, yeah, we need a 102 instructor. You're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did teach 102, believe it or not. Um, I did teach cost accounting, but I did it from a journal entry perspective, which probably was not the way most students would have loved to have seen it. But what I have learned in teaching is that you either love 101 or you love 102, but you don't love both. Very few people say, oh, I love financial accounting and cost accounting. Typically, one is going to click for them better than the other. So I was not all that unique in that area. Okay. (laughs) You have really been fortunate with the teaching opportunities being available at the right time. That's really awesome. 
It has been and it hasn't been. I actually applied twice or three times to go and get my PhD and I've never been accepted to a PhD program. So I had thought at one point of going back and getting my PhD and that's what I wanted to do because I have always had a passion for teaching. What I've learned is most PhD programs are really trying to produce research people and not necessarily people who have a passion for teaching. And so CPE came and was like, oh, well, we do want teachers and we don't want research. And so that's really what I got my first draw on. So I worked, for, I mean, I've been working with Becker for over a decade in various positions. I started out as just a live instructor, and then I became uh, in charge of a region, and then I started teaching for them as a national instructor on their live online classes when they moved to that format, and then I've taught their continuing professional education. So they have always been a great opportunity, and they've been great to work with and giving me opportunities to try things I haven't done before. So it's definitely been really awesome, but I always thought I was going to get a PhD, and I'm so grateful that it didn't work out because I think this was the path that was meant to be. So sometimes you try something and it doesn't work and it's a humbling experience to some extent uh, that, you know, multiple schools didn't want me when that was not my experience applying for college. I was, you know, I had a great acceptance rate for undergrad and I was like, why don't these universities want me? But it ended up being a blessing. And so I ended up being able to really carve my own career path and it wouldn't have happened had I done it the other way. So you always have to kind of be willing to see what the universe has in store for you. I'd be curious about the national instructor title. Excuse my ignorance on this. Does that simply indicate that you're teaching online and therefore it can be viewed anywhere or is there sort of a hierarchy? Correct. Oh, okay. There's a little bit of a hierarchy. So (laughs) we have your standard instructors and then you have what would be your lead instructor. So I had always had the lead instructor role. I took over originally the Charlotte market as a lead instructor, hiring new instructors, having them do their demos and things like that, making sure that we had the right number and the different skill sets and people who were passionate about a particular area. And then I took over all of North Carolina when we had a lot of the live classes. And then when they made that move to online, they picked in particular certain instructors who would do well in in a live online setting. So not everybody who teaches a live course teaches a live online course. And then they have their they're sort of the faces of Becker to some extent that I would say that you see if you buy the courses like the Angie Browns and the Michael Browns and the Peter Olintos of the world who kind of represent the face of Becker. And I've been fortunate over the years to meet with all of them. I've met every one of their major instructors, some, some that I actually took courses from when I took Becker are still teaching for them today. And so being involved, I've been up to their corporate headquarters in Chicago a few times and had that opportunity to work with them. So it's been great. Now, we had Tim McGeardy. Geardy. Right? Yes. Yeah, Geardy, I'm sorry. So he is one of those national faces of Becker that everybody recognizes as we go through it. When I, I'm just, I'm learning. When I interviewed him for the show, I thought there were one or two national instructors. I didn't realize it's, it's quite a large team, apparently. <laughs> yeah. For the live online, yes, they have quite a bit. And then they have improved their gender diversity. Uh, Angie Brown's an amazing instructor, and she has done a lot of the national work for them as well. So I am very proud of the group. And it's changed over the years who kind of does the recording, but they have always really tried to focus on the people that have the best command of the underlying content and can explain it in a way that makes the most sense. Sure. So are you still an adjunct as well, or have you let that drop? That's a sore subject. When we moved to North Carolina a few years ago, so eight years ago now, I taught at Georgetown for a number of years. And then my husband was transferred from our DC, where we lived in DC, in the Washington DC area. We were transferred down to Charlotte. And when I moved to the Charlotte area, while we do have universities here, I am unqualified to teach in the community college or in the universities here because I don't have a master's degree. And so Georgetown, because it's a private university, university was able to substitute my continuing education as well as my CPA license to teach at the universities here. State law does not permit me to teach in the university setting. So when I moved here, I was super disappointed. I applied to a bunch of even community colleges and the fact that I don't have a master's degree prevents me from teaching in the university setting here. Wow. Okay. I'm a lost, right? <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. I was like, I just taught at Georgetown. And they were like, yeah, but that's a different set of rules. So it was definitely interesting when I moved here. But again, it just opened up other opportunities that I probably would have not pursued had I taught again at the university level. So tell us about Galasso Learning Solutions. How did that begin? And I guess, what's the vision for the future? And what you sure, do, so, <laughs> the middle part, too. 
<laughs> Absolutely. I have always had a passion for education, starting when I was in college and teaching and then going back and in addition to whatever my day job was, teaching for Becker in the evenings and on the weekends. And it's always been something I loved. I worked in national office for a national size firm and worked in their continuing education. And it's always been something that really has really been something that's a key part of me. And I was working in public accounting full time and I just wasn't passionate about what I was doing. I've gotten to the point where I was feeling stale and I wasn't happy. And I decided to talk to a career coach. And I know that sounds odd, but I felt like I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I knew what my skill sets were, but I couldn't really envision what I wanted to do. And so I sat down and I met multiple times with her and we kept coming back to where my passion was, but I had this whole fear of being an entrepreneur. I'm very risk averse. I'm made to be an accountant. And I just couldn't envision starting my own thing. And I worked with a career coach who was like, you just need to take the one step forward. And I was like, well, I don't even know how to set up a company. And she's like, okay, your homework tonight, because when you work with a coach, you get homework in every <laughs> session. <laughs> That's how they work, is to go out and find out how to become an LLC in the state of North Carolina. So I did that. And then she goes, okay, next up is to come up with a name. And so I talked to a bunch of people. And, you know, I threw out Golasso training solutions. I, I threw out Golasso training this and that. And I talked to people and I did surveys and Facebook and trying to get feedback. And we came back to Golasso learning solutions. And then each time she pushed me one step further until I had literally applied for a business. And I was working full time at that point. And so I obviously did not continue full time. I decreased my workload and then have decreased my workload to to go away from that full-time element of it, but it grew a lot faster. I originally just wanted to replace half my income going to a half position. I was like, well, if I just replace half of it, but I didn't realize how much I was going to love having the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with firms. And so Glossal Learning Solutions specializes in custom CPE. So I sit down with firms, we do a needs assessment, we go through the process of identifying what would make sense, customizing it. You don't need a FASB update that includes 10 things that you're never going to use because your clients don't do those types of transactions. So scaling it down to what they really need and doing that deep focus. And so taking that and working one-on-one -on -one and really knowing their business, knowing their client base, knowing what they need, and then providing that service. And so we have been in business for a little, just about four and a half years now, and we are just, I'm loving it. It continues to grow. We have over the years become, you know, started out really as a side gig, right? That's literally what it was. It was just in addition to the income I was making working in public accounting, and then it has just continues to grow. This year, we did a huge focus on documenting processes because you can't grow if you're the only person who knows how to do something. So documenting our processes was a big element, getting all of our procedures down, putting things into these SOPs that are documented similarly, and then branching out, hiring additional people. So we've grown from a firm of one, adding on a virtual assistant, adding on a finance person, operations person, marketing. So continuing to see growth in this area. And then we've added on some subcontractors as well. So I specialize in accounting and auditing, but I've been able and fortunate in travel and you know just being able to meet people that are great instructors in areas that I don't necessarily teach, like employee benefit plans, and so have been able to work with instructors who are fantastic and can really help my clients in a way I cannot, and so growing in that scenario. So the long-term goal is to be able to identify amazing instructors who have, you know, meet our core values, and we have, you know, documented those, and they hang on the wall all over the office here, trying to remind people what those are, and then when we meet people who meet those core values, seeing if they would fit and align with our client base and can continuing to grow and to be able to serve our clients. Interesting. I've got a lot of questions. So one thing that you said caught my interest, you have a physical office? Because I know you uh, I just, online, but uh-huh. <laughs> I have an office in my house. We actually converted it into a studio about a year, a little bit over a year ago. So I have a two in front of me right now in my office. I have two big umbrellas that are giving me my backlighting. I have multiple microphones set up. I have a green screen behind me. I have an alternative white screen. I have my big boom mic here. And so I have a full-fledged office that is able to provide webinars as well as on-demand product using some of the most state-of-the-art technology for quality. So really one of those technology items 
last year after traveling, I did 130 flights to get through 2019, which was a lot of flights. So when I set my goals for 2020, I said I wanted to do less travel. I needed to be more specific and not say no travel. I should have been a little clearer. I haven't been on an airplane since February. American Airlines called to check on me the other day to make sure I was okay. They literally had a customer service agent call just to see how my family was doing because I haven't flown since February. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. I've talked to a few trainers that, yeah, this is a little more free time than they really wanted. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. We have offered all of our courses, unless it was a conference that didn't go, we have converted every single course to virtual, and we have leveraged technology to make it feel as much like you're in person as possible. We don't use webinar software. We actually use meeting software so that people can still see each other's faces and that they can communicate. They're not on mute. They can go and they can have a conversation. We do breakout sessions and small group conversations and case studies, just like you would in a live setting, leveraging the technology available today. So we have tried to the extent possible not to cancel anything. So we have, you know, I've taught uh, four eight-hour classes this week. <laughs> so we are still uh, still producing content. We are still providing the education that people need and just looks a little different in terms of format. Wow. So, yeah, I guess your busy season is basically the opposite of the accounting busy season, right? I mean, <laughs> that is <laughs> correct. May and okay. June are my biggest months, and then November, December, obviously, are pretty big. And then there's different items. So, obviously, May and June are big on nonprofit and government. Those are where I see the biggest draw right now. And then when we get into the end of the year, it's more of your traditional FASB update, AICPA update, keeping people going forward. So, it does give us that opportunity to offer all of that and really in our specialty. And if I don't offer that topic, I find someone who does. I don't like to do classes that are not inside my wheelhouse because I do think that customization and specialization is really important. Okay. Yeah, obviously I knew you did CE training, but I didn't realize it was customized specific to the firms. That's intriguing. Mm -hmm. That really is. That's, that's an interesting business model. It's really fun. I went back to school, actually. I got my certified professional in talent development, so I sat for another exam after I thought I swore off after the CPA exam. I was never doing that again. I did sit for a two-part exam. It was actually two different days. You have to take it. It's a part one and a part two. And I got my certified professional in talent development, and I also got my master trainer designation from the Association from Talent Development. So I actually went back to school to learn how to deliver training and the best practices and just overall talent management. And so talking about instructional design, understanding best practices and how you deliver training and what virtual training looks like and how to take the instructional design from a live class and convert it to virtual. So I spent a lot of time uh, studying and taking courses in order to be able to provide a more custom level of training that is based on principles that are actually about adult learning and not just telling people what I know. Sure. Wow. Now, you were referred to us by Sarah Elliott, former guest on the show. Love, Sarah. <laughs> Yes, yes. Very generous individual. She mentioned something about hosting or, or starting women's conferences or arranging women's conferences or something. Yes, that is that probably one of my biggest passion projects. I okay. am very involved at the women's, in, you know, in favor of women's conferences. I have been for the last five years the chair of the Professional Women's Conference here in North Carolina. And then last year, the Virginia Society of CPAs, where I'm a board member, started their Women's Leadership Forum. And so I worked on their planning committee. And I love to identify speakers in areas that help CPAs improve and touch on topics that you might not normally see. And so I've worked really hard on developing and the NCA CPA Women's Conference has sold out every year and they've had to change locations every year to accommodate more and more women. And then this year we actually expanded from two sessions at the conference to three concurrent sessions because of the growth in the program. And so we're able to serve more women and provide them continuing education and personal development that's really important because it's really about developing yourself as a person and lifelong learning. So one of our core values at Glossal Learning Solutions is that passion for continuous learning and being able to expand our horizons, whether it's technical or not. Wow. Okay. You do a lot. Because <laughs> you're teaching yourself, because I mean, we talked about this before we started recording, that it's the end of your day where you are, and you've been teaching all day, and now you're recording I have podcast. Been. And it's like, <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. Okay. It is part of balancing. You, you kind of get you good at it. I mean, and I think it's great to be able to give back. I was appointed this year to the AICPA's Women's Initiative Executive Committee, taking my local empowerment and bringing it to a more national level. And I think it gives us the opportunity. So I believe firmly in giving back and being part of it. I've volunteered on the AICPA's Technical Issues Committee. They're the ones who write the exposure drafts on behalf of the AICPA to the technical standard setters. I have volunteered for a and committees at the state level because I do believe that if you are involved in the process, then you can make a difference. If you don't like the outcome of something, but you didn't participate, then you get the outcome that you deserve, it's just sort of like voting. So same concept here. You need to be involved in the future of the profession if you want to steer it in a particular way. Good point. Good point. Well, this has been a good conversation. I have some questions I end every show with, and I want to make sure I leave plenty of time for that. Well, one more thing, though, before we get to that. Your business is still relatively new. It's in the first five years, although you've been teaching a long time, but Galasso Learning Solutions is, right? I mean, it's still in the first five years of business. That's right? correct. Mm-hmm. Okay. If this goes exactly how you would like it to go, what does that look like three, five years down the road? Where do you want to be? Are, do you have a, an army of thousands of instructors <laughs> yeah, at that point? I hope not an army of thousands of instructors, but we do have. We are an EOS. We run on the entrepreneurial operating system, so we are an ERS, so we have a 10-year oh. goal, and that is to you know bring on more instructors in complementary areas as well as areas that I also teach to continue to provide education but for people who are really committed to not just telling you what the changes are, but the why, the how, being practical, being engaging, and really caring not about just the topic, but also the design behind it. So my goal is to find more of me's out there and bring them on board. Wow. Okay. I usually don't plug a podcast from a podcast, but just you may be interested. Our first guest, a gentleman by the name of Don Maranca, is a CPA that got into coaching and is an EOS implementer for the area I'm in. And I've interviewed him a couple of times. And you may find that episode intriguing, but you're a planner. <laughs> <laughs> to go through the EOS process is quite a commitment in and of itself, much less. It was one of my yeah. best, adv- you know, when you want to expand, you can't do it without having processes and you can't have do it without having a vision. And you really need to start the whole, you know, the story behind traction is really knowing where you want to go. And so we took the time as a group and we still have our weekly EOS meetings and our monthly meeting. And I meet with all of my people, whether it's me directly or one of my direct reports meets with their direct reports to continue that process forward because that's the way to grow. It's not in a, you know, just haphazard, but a really strategic method forward. Wow. Wow. We're going to have to do a second episode with you in a year or two because there'll be a lot to talk about. There'll be a lot to talk about, I'm sure. Well, I, I do... can talk for hours and hours a day, apparently. <laughs> yes, you're a professional. <laughs> well, I do end every show with the same three questions, and so we better get to those. The first okay. one is usually the easier one. From a career perspective, what has been your proudest moment? I would say, believe it or not, I thought the CPA exam was really hard. It was four, you know, two days, four sections all in a row. But I would tell you that from a career perspective, attaining my CPTD was probably one of those moments. It was not my best score. I scored really well on the CPA exam. It was, it came to me naturally. Passing the CPTD was probably one of the hardest and most humbling things. I had the flashcards going. I was writing my things out. And when I got the score, which comes out like eight weeks later, so like the old CPA exam, you get your thing in the mail. And I was like, oh my God, I just barely passed. But I passed and I am able to now say that. And it was really impressive that I was, you know, the amount of effort in addition to teaching full time that that took to me was one of those shining moments where it showed that you do have to put in some, you know, you know, a lot of hard work and some elbow grease to bring back that. I'd never taken an online exam. I never took a computerized exam. So sitting in the classroom, I was like, I have never done this. This is all unique to me. And so it was a very proud moment that day that came in the mail. That, you're right. I haven't had any guests on the show say that something was more challenging for them than the CPA. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. I like the CPA exam. <laughs> <laughs> well, second question, and this can be from your accounting days, instructing days, whenever, you business. Tell us about a lesson that you have learned the hard way. And the more you can tell us about what that situation was, the better, because that's how everybody learns. 
<laughs> so I definitely learned the hard way that you have to let other people help. I have always been sort of a planner control. If I can control the situation, it's going to turn out great, but it gets to a point where you can't do everything yourself. And I waited way too long to hire any additional help. I spent the first three years by myself booking a hundred and something flights a year and doing my own invoices and doing everything. And I got to the point where I was so exhausted and things were so behind and I was behind on invoicing and I couldn't keep up. And so I finally said to someone, I was like, okay, I need to dig myself out of this, but I had waited way too long. And so at that point, nothing was documented. Nothing was ready to go because I just always had everything in my head. And so one of my biggest learnings, and now I'm sort of at that point where I say pretty frequently, you know what, if someone else can do it better than me and faster, then we should embrace that. And it's okay that I can't do everything. And I, it's not, you know, I don't control everything. And for someone who is really sort of a perfectionist overcoming that concept. Uh, it definitely was a rough one for me, but over the last couple of years, I've now embraced this concept of bring on additional people and it's okay. And it's okay to have other people support you and want to see the same vision as you. But I will tell you those first few years, I was like, I can do this all. I can do every part of the business. I can be a business of one. And I see a lot of speakers who are a business of one. And I will tell you it's exhausting. And it's definitely a lesson learned for me was to let that go and let people, you know, they might not do it exactly the same way I would, but it's better than me not getting it done. Yes. Yes. I heard a long time ago, if there's someone you can delegate something to and they can do it 80% as well yeah. as you think. And I'm not sure that was like official quote or the person was just making up the statistic, but you should delegate it, you know, and because most of us think we're going to do it better. And that's helped me a lot. Yeah. I can relate. I can relate to that for sure. I'm very impressed with just how open you are and, and how much you've realized that it's good to get help in business. You have a coach, you're going through the EOS system, you're talking about delegating, you know, that you don't know it all, that you've realized that early. That's really remarkable. I wish I had learned it even earlier, but it is something, it's a lesson that once you learn, I think is, has a huge impact on your mental health as well. Definitely. Well, last question, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What has been the best piece of advice that you have ever received? I think it would be when my coach said that you don't have to know the end result. You just have to take one step in the direction you want to go. And that's what she came back with every single time is she said, you don't know, have to know exactly how you're going to get to the end. You just have to keep taking one step in that direction. And then if you're intentional, you'll get to that end goal without having to see the whole path. And for someone who like me is very controlling and wants to plan and wants to know, taking that one baby step is a lot less brisk. And then it also helps you to get comfortable with each step of the way. And so I have nothing but the utmost respect. A couple of years ago, I won an award for my business from the uh, local NABO here, the National Association of Women Business Owners. Uh, we were, GLS won an award and I actually invited her at my table for that award because I felt it was so much of what she helped me see in what I could do. And I just owed so much to her. So I actually invited her and she sat at my table along with some of my amazing clients and my family to celebrate that amazing day. And we didn't know I was going to win. I knew I was a finalist, but um, I ended up winning the award that night. And it was such an honor to have her there to see that happen and all the work that had been done since meeting with her and where we come from. That's neat. That is neat. Well, this has been a fun interview. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been fun for me too. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. If people want to find out more about Glosso Learning Solutions, because obviously almost everyone that listens to the show is in accounting, so <laughs> where's the best place to find out more? Sure. We have our own website, obviously, ColossalLearningSolutions.com. And I'm also very active on social media. So if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, we post very frequently about what's going on. And we have a weekly blog as well as a monthly newsletter that keeps people up to date on what's going on in the profession. Wow. Okay. Hopefully you're getting some assistance with the blog and the newsletter. Hopefully you've delegated. I just them. tape it and they all put it out there. <laughs> there you go. So yes, my, my marketing person actually knows how to do that. I only know how to tape video. I don't know, actually know how to post anything. <laughs> well, thank you again. I really appreciate you making the time for this today. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me.
Well, that was my interview with Melissa Galasso. And like I mentioned in the intro, I really love a story where someone is able to find what they're passionate about and then find a way to make a living in that passion. And by the way, she wouldn't have got there if she wouldn't have started with a background in accounting. Melissa has a perfect story for us, for our listeners, and definitely for our show. And I hope you got a lot out of it. I really appreciate how open she was. And I know I said this earlier, but it just amazes me. When we recorded this, she had been teaching all day for several days, and she's still just a off the scale energy level. It was just awesome. I really enjoyed recording this. I hope you enjoyed the show as well. And if you did, please do leave us a rating. And if you have ideas for future guests or other episodes, please reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. I love to hear from listeners, particularly with suggestions or ideas or feedback. Well, thank you again for joining us. I'm Mark Goldman, your host for Where Accountants Go, the Accounting Careers podcast. We'll see you next week. There's more to come.